conception of the three liter began with the directors briefing the stylist, who then translated a multitude of guiding principles into hundreds of working drawings. With his experienced team of artists, modelers, engineers, he worked on every detail of the car, looked at it from every angle, and examined every possible advantage. After months of this process, with fundamental changes and seemingly trivial alterations to detail, a basic line was decided upon. The first tangible stage was to make a quarter scale model in clay and at last an idea emerged of how the car would look. A gracious design with a continental verve with an appeal to all the world's markets. A wooden mock-up complete in essential details was an early stage of the interior design. This wooden lay figure, weighted at various points to reproduce the exact distribution of a human's weight, was number one passenger. An elegant car must appeal to elegant drivers, and the woman's angle was studied when designing the interior. It is no good building beautiful seats that will ladder nylons, or doors in which a skirt might catch, so the feminine approach was covered thoroughly. The fascia panel again was first and foremost practical, but also had to look distinctive. Colour was all important from the word go. One method of studying the effect of light on different planes was to spray paper with lacquer and try it against the contours of the full-scale car model. The Rover Company has always preferred colours of restraint and this preference was to be followed in the new car. At the same time, in the engineering drawing office, every board was taken up with some detail of the priorities assigned to the engineering department. The design of the new engine, transmission, suspension, and construction. In the experimental department, prototype engines were made, tested, modified, remade. The three-liter engine was a development of the famous 90 engine. It had improved low-speed torque and pulling power. One of its outstanding features was the new seven-bearing crankshaft. Another was the single carburetor, which has advantages over the twin system in many parts of the world where servicing opportunities may be infrequent. The Rover designed roller tappets operating on a six bearing camshaft showed a distinct departure from the old type engine. At last, a prototype emerged from the shop. It was a complete prototype of the finished car and was to undergo two years of intensive punishment on the road so that any defects could be eliminated from the start. This car and one of its replicas went through many months of testing at the Motor Industry Research Association's test track and the car that can stand up to thousands of miles of this and the other tests carried out by rovers is fit for anything. If it is not shaken to breaking point on the pave, fast periods on the switchback pumps may still find a weakness. Gradients of one in four and one in three are as steep as anything encountered on the roads of the world. At this stage, and at all stages in the manufacture of any Rover car, the quality control department has complete authority over all others in maintaining quality standards. Often the Rover standards for raw materials are so high that nothing is commercially available so their steels and alloys have to be individually made to detailed rover specifications. Projection microscopes are used to check the physical structure of samples. A specially designed cabinet in which cultures of virulent molds grow under tropical conditions is used for testing fabrics and upholstery materials. Components bought out are subjected to rigorous tests. Heat treatment is one of the tests applied to rubber components which must have a guaranteed life of many tough years. A fatigue tester reproduces on a laminated torsion bar the stress of hundreds of thousands of rough motoring miles and the parts are put through this ordeal until they snap.
road prototypes are off the road meanwhile, and electronic equipment records the way they are standing up to strains far greater than any the car will ever be required to meet on the road. At the engine works, more tests are being made. This time to see that materials coming from suppliers reach the standards set by the purchasing office. A camshaft is checked for hardness and a record kept of the pressure needed for a diamond to make a mark on it. A loaded hammer is swung down on a thin billet of metal. The weight taken to snap it and the way it breaks determine the true temper of the metal. Other samples are given a tensile test gripped at both ends and pulled until the shape changes and they begin to stretch. At last they snap and the dial keeps a record of the point at which they yielded. In the gear works, the most precise machinery made in the world is used to grind the wheels. There is scarcely a chance that there could be any irregularities in these gear wheels but to obviate the slightest possibility, women stone each wheel to remove any bits of metal adhering to it. Every wheel is measured by this specially designed machine. The graph recording its shape is filed away so that if any part of a Rover gearbox failed, its life history could be checked. Then the gears are paired, mated for the rest of their lives. They are run together and skilled craftsmen listen for the slightest sound of disharmony. If the noise is wrong, the match is imperfect and the wheels are changed. Elaborate equipment, also designed and made in the works, since nothing like it can be bought elsewhere, is used to test the finished gearboxes.